Namaste. So today we're going to continue with the beginning of the first section of Kaivalya Navanitam. What we've been through so far is just the introduction. And this begins the section called the Exposition of Truth. The sages say that there are four prerequisites for realization of the truth. One, viveka, discrimination between the temporary, therefore unreal phenomena, and the permanent, therefore the reality, that is the noumenal. Two, indifference to the enjoyment of pleasures here or hereafter. Three, the group of six qualities. And four, the longing for liberation. The six qualities are sama, dhamma, uparati, titiksha, samadhana, and shraddha. Of these, sama is control of mind. Dhamma is control of the senses. Uparati is cessation of activities relating to caste, creed, family, etc. Titiksha is control of passions and includes endurance. Samadhana is, according to the sages, the settling down of the mind to reflect on the truth as revealed by the scriptures and the sages. Shraddha denotes faith in the master and the scriptures. Such are the meanings of the six terms of this category. So we have encountered these before. These are the same prerequisites given by Adi Shankaracharya in his commentary on the Vedanta Sutra. In fact, they're in the introduction and they're in his commentary to the very first sutra, which we've gone over in a previous series. So I'm not going to go into the technical definitions of these terms. But what I want to highlight is that for any of this to be successful, one has to have divine discontent. That means one looks at the world and that includes the body and the mind, no? as disgusting, useless, unsatisfactory, or in a word, suffering. One has to be very, very convinced that this world is nothing but suffering, that one's so-called own body and mind are similarly only venues for suffering. Uh, the Buddha explained this very nicely. He said the world has three qualities and they are impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and not self. Self with a capital S. So any way you slice it, this world is always going to be disappointing it's never going to give the satisfaction that we want. And there's nothing we can do about it because the primary duality of consciousness itself between subject and object is the cause of this condition. Try to understand. Consciousness means I am the watcher and I am watching something over here. Now, the, the something that I'm watching can vary tremendously. It can be my own senses or my own mind or through the mind and senses, other different objects in the world. Jagat, huh? So many objects, a plethora of objects. 
And they all have these three characteristics in common. Impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. Or even if I contemplate the senses as the senses, or the mind as the mind, they still have these same three qualities. And therefore, ultimately, they are unsatisfying to the self. Now, we've talked about so many theoretical things about how the self is different from the body, how the self is not part of the world, how the world actually comes out of the self and is created by the self, and so on and so on and so forth. But these are all mostly theoretical. But the actual experience of being qualified for liberation is that one is completely disgusted with the world. That one realizes this world will never give the satisfaction I'm looking for. And so one becomes fit to abandon the world, turn one's back on it, and go inside in search of the real self. So this is the actual beginning of spiritual life. Everything up to this point has just been preliminary. Until you sit down and go inside, and not as a matter of discipline. Huh? It's not a formal practice that one sits down, okay, well, I have a 15-minute meditation now. <laughs> it's ridiculous. You won't get anywhere with that. I mean, over the long term, it may help you build the habit of meditating and somehow or other uh, develop a tolerance to just sitting, huh? which is good. But until you reach the point of being really totally disgusted with the material life, you won't really, <laughs> you won't really go inside with the right orientation, with the right attitude. So we see this a lot. I'm living in Tiruvannamala, India, and we see a lot of spiritual tourists come. And they sit and they pretend to meditate. But are they really meditating? No. How do I know? They don't get enlightened. Now, how do I know they don't get enlightened? Because immediately afterwards they go to the tea shop <laughs> and start gossiping about who is sleeping with who. <laughs> so this is impossible. This is not enlightenment, you see. There's still a dual consciousness. So as long as that dual consciousness exists, as long as there's a difference between I and other, between self and the world, there can't be enlightenment. Because in Brahman, there's no duality. There's no difference. There's no boundaries. There's no divisions, no distinctions, no discriminations. Brahman is one seamless whole. And you can't realize that through the senses or the mind. You can only realize it by confronting Brahman directly within. And that's not just not going to happen <laughs> until you're completely disgusted with the world, unless there's absolutely no hope in your mind of ever achieving satisfaction in life, in the world. You have to be finished with it. You have to be ready to turn your back on the mind and senses, lose interest in them, and go inside with a whole and complete concentration and unity of purpose and dedication. That this is it. This is my last chance. Huh? There's no hope anywhere else. That is the actual prerequisite for self-realization. Now, all these other qualities that he's given are very nice. Uh, and the sages and the scriptures agree in many places that these are necessary. Uh, but really, what is driving them? For example, to, to give up activities in relation to caste 
and family and career and all that kind of stuff. Say, so how many people do you know who have actually done that? Or even if they give up a career in, let's say, some business or some artistic discipline, craft or whatever, then they become a religious person. They put on a certain color clo cloths huh? and <laughs> they go down to the temple and they make a career of that. That becomes their identity. And it's an external identity, just as much as being in a family or in a business or whatever. Huh? Being a holy man, being a, a preacher, a teacher, a representative of some religious group or teaching is just as much of an identity in the external world as being a family man or a businessman or whatever. So don't just switch one career for another. That's not going to help. But rather, one should see that any kind of career, any kind of identity in this world is not going to give the satisfaction that we crave at the deepest level. And one will always be dissatisfied. One will always be hankering for something more but because we project that hankering on the world and we think, oh, if I just, maybe if I go somewhere else or maybe if I get some different friends or maybe if I have a different job or maybe if I join a different religion or maybe this, maybe that, it can go on and on forever. And it does. And this is samsara. This is why we take birth again and again in this material world. Well, I took birth in this country, in this family, in this religion, and it wasn't satisfactory. So now I'm going to try this other planet, this other family, this other religion or whatever, this other species, or it could be anything, anything, anything that's possible in the world. Huh? But it's still not going to be satisfactory you're still going to get to the end of the next life thinking, oh, that really wasn't right. <laughs> this is samsara. This is why the samsara, the round of births and deaths, is compared to a raging forest fire. When there's a forest fire, it can start just by natural causes, lightning, or the friction of bamboos in the dry season from the wind. Uh, that's enough to start it. But once it gets going, it just devastates everything in its path. So this samsara is like that. It starts spontaneously. As soon as we accept the duality of consciousness, observer and observed. As soon as we go into the awareness of the world, consciousness of the world, then we need senses. Then we need a mind to figure out what the senses are telling us. Huh? And so we construct all these castles in the air made of thoughts only. Thoughts words and forms name and form the buddha calls it actually the vedas call it same so if we construct this whole castle this whole model of the world and it's wrong <laughs> it has to be wrong huh just like a map if i have a map let's say i want to go on a journey and i get a map the map is not the territory the map is going to be different from the actual experience. And the same with the mind. Any model of the world that we construct in the mind is going to be wrong. And the main thing that's wrong with it is that we think there is duality. No, there is no duality. The only thing that really exists is Brahman. Brahman alone exists. And Brahman is non-dual. 
So as soon as we accept duality, we're going to suffer. There's no way out of it. So we have to become completely disgusted with consciousness, the objects of consciousness, and the duality underlying consciousness itself. And that's really the prerequisite for going deep into meditation and actually realizing the self. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum.